You know, yesterday was supposed to be the end of the world. Anybody hear about that? Anybody glad that that didn't happen at that point? <laughs> if it did, we wouldn't be here, would we, right now? You know, there's a guy named David Mead who had been making some predictions recently about that. He's a guy who has written a book about Planet X, and, and his claims are saying that yesterday, Saturday, the 23rd of September, a constellation was supposed to appear in the sky over Jerusalem, and that was supposed to um, kind of go along with uh, Revelation chapter 12, where it talks about a constellation uh, depicting a woman in the sky. He said that's supposed to take place yesterday, and then in October that there are supposed to be signs of, of uh, impending doom, so to speak, that will begin to occur, and there will be a seven-year tribulation that will begin to happen because of what's happening in October. He says the planet uh, Nibiru is uh, supposed to be coming close to Earth, and it's going to cause earthquakes and volcanic eruptions and tidal waves and other cat catastrophes as well. And I want you to know that, that certainly because of the hurricanes and the earthquakes that we've been having recently, a number of people said, you know, maybe this guy has something to say to us. Maybe he's right. And there was a bit of consternation about this. I understand out in California that there were television programs interrupted by a commercial that came on talking about the end of the world at that time, making people feel very antsy at that point. So I want you to know that thankfully it did not happen yesterday or else we would wouldn't be here right now, and but we do need to think about things about the end of the world, and especially we need to consider the things, that, the most important thing that goes along with that, and that is the return of Jesus Christ. So today, if you're looking at your bulletin, if you'll turn it over on the back, you'll find an outline there. This outline is actually not exactly accurate. Uh, there are a number of spaces in there that we will not be filling in today, but the main points will still be filled in, and I hope that you'll want to follow along because we'll put them up on the screen as we're going along. You know, the predictions of, uh, of David Mead remind me that over the last several years, we've had a number of people who have talked about the end of the world, who have said, here are different signs, or it's going to happen here, or it's going to happen there, or it's going to happen now at this particular point, and, and every one of them has proven to be inaccurate. In fact, there are a lot of people who, who just feel like, well, maybe it's just never going to happen at all. But uh, the Bible tells us that there were those, even in Bible times, who believed that the second coming of Jesus would be a hoax. Maybe just kind of purported out there for the church to kind of keep control over people. And there were people that Peter described who said that, where is this, uh, where is this coming he talked about? When's this going to happen? And there's their scoffers, he said. And, and Peter writes in his book saying that, you know, we need to be aware that, that uh, this is not something that is a hoax, it's something that really is going to happen. He begins to share some things about that that we'll go into just a little bit today further on in the message. When Jesus talked about the end of the world, he talked about it with absolute certainty. He said that he was going to come during that time. He also shared the fact that no one knows the time or the day when that's supposed to occur. Even he did not know when that was going to occur while he was here on the earth. Now, I think that that's interesting because here he is. He's a son of God. He is God in the flesh. But there was a purposeful limitation of his knowledge at that particular point because of his humanity. But I can guarantee you that right now, Jesus knows exactly when he's coming back. And he is primed and ready for that day. And he wants us to make sure that we too are ready for that day as well. And I want to share some things with you today that I believe will be helpful to you and important for you to understand. Well, we also need to understand the Bible talks a lot about the end of the world, talks a lot about the return of Jesus Christ. In fact, one scholar estimated that there are 1,845 references to the second coming of Jesus found in the Old Testament, even before he came to the world the first time. And in the New Testament, there are 318 verses that talk about it. For every one prophecy that points toward the coming of Christ at Christmas, we find that there are eight prophecies that are given that look to his return. It's not interesting because we spend a lot of time in December talking about what the Bible says about Jesus' birth. But in reality, oftentimes we miss an awful lot about what it says about his return. And we need to make sure that we are balanced in that, that we understand if the Bible talks about this eight times more than his coming, we need to make sure that that's something that we understand that we're ready for, that we are informed about. So I want to share three main things with you today. And the very first one is believe the promises. Be informed. 
believe the promises, be informed. We're accustomed to the promises of someone returning, aren't we? If you have a son or a daughter who has left home and gone off to college, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? Because you know that the time is going to come when they are going to come back. They're going to come back with a few different things. They're going to come back probably with a friend, okay? They're probably going to come back with a load of laundry to be done. They're going to come back being hungry, okay? And they're going to come back and they're going to want to stay a while and enjoy their time with you. And you are going to want to enjoy your time with them as well. There's a promise that is given saying, I'll be back. And certainly that time comes when they are back and you enjoy that time with them. And General Douglas MacArthur was leaving the Philippines to go to Brisbane, Australia to establish new headquarters in the war against Japan. He promised those people in the Philippines, I shall return. When astronauts are, are monitoring and viewing the space shuttle reentry into the Earth's atmosphere, there's a cry from Houston that says, reentry has been achieved. When Arnold Schwarzenegger starred as the Terminator, his most famous line was, I'll be back. That's exactly right. Yeah, they say that's one of the most one of the one of the 100 most known lines from movies of all time, and I believe that probably in the top 10, I would think everybody knows that line. I'll be back. And the thing is, is that Jesus was saying, "I'll be back. I will return." We need to understand what he meant by that. You know, the Old Testament calls it the day of the Lord and the return of Jesus Christ. And a lot of well-known, reliable men of the Old Testament wrote about it. Job, and, and Job talked about it. Moses, David, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, the minor prophets, many of them talk about the return of Jesus as well. And we skip to the New Testament, we find even in the very last book, the book of Revelation, the last chapter of Revelation, Jesus says three times in that chapter, I am returning. I am coming back. And during his ministry, Jesus guaranteed that he would do that. I want us to take a look at the book of Matthew today, chapter 24. If you're using a Bible there in the chair in front of you, it's page 1538. Book of Matthew, 1538, Matthew 24. Uh, verses 30 and 31 are where we're going to start, but we're going to look at several different places in that chapter, as well as a few other places in Scripture as well. But if you turn to that, you'll find that Jesus guarantees his return. In verses 30 and 31, he said, at that time, in other words, when I come back, the sign of the Son of Man, meaning Jesus himself, will appear in the sky, and all the nations of the earth will mourn. In other words, they'll be saying, oh, no. We weren't ready for that time. They'll see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the, of the heavens to the other. Now, we need to understand the context of, of what Jesus is saying right here. In this chapter, we find that Jesus was with his disciples, and they were in Jerusalem. And you probably know that in Jerusalem, the, the, the uh, building that brought the most attention was the temple. That was where all the religious activity occurred. And, and uh, of course, it was well known as a place that Solomon had built in those days. And, and what, a, what a beautiful place it was. Now, we find that, that here we are. We've got this, this wonderful temple, and Jesus' disciples are looking at it. And they are, are saying, boy, this is just fantastic. This is wonderful out here. And Jesus says, you know, the time's coming when not one of the stones that's here is going to be still standing on top of the other, okay? It's going to all be destroyed someday. And we know that in A.D. 70, it was destroyed by the Romans when they came in. But they ask three questions in the process of this. First of all, they ask, when will the temple be destroyed? A.D. 70 is when it was going to take place. The second thing, what will be the sign of your coming? And then thirdly, what will be the sign of the end of the age? Did you notice that two of the three questions include the word sign? They want to know what to look for. They want to know what is going to appear that they might be able to begin to make sure that they're ready for this, that they know that time is coming. And twice that word sign is used there. And so Jesus wants them to know the truth, and so he begins to tell them about signs. And that brings us to the second point. Believe the signs. Be alert. Believe the signs. Be alert. He says in verses 4 and 5 of chapter 24, and also in 23 and 24, that there are going to be some false teachers, religious deceivers, 
false religions proliferating. Uh, there are a lot of religious people in the world, aren't there? All kinds of religions out there. Christianity is, is still the largest religion in the world. However, Islam is certainly gaining ground on us, isn't it? It's really, really growing exponentially. But at the same time, there are a number of people in places where Christianity used to be the predominant faith who are now are beginning to reject Christianity and beginning to embrace other types of teachings and false religions. For example, um, Native American Indian uh, religions are being embraced by more people all the time. Eastern religions have grown in popularity over the last 50 years. New Age teachings are still very popular. Angel worship is something which a number of people have been engaged in. In 2015, in Detroit, Michigan, there was a statue of Satan that was erected there and placed in a particular area, and it shows little children gathered around that in this statue, and they're looking admirably at Satan. Even Satanism seems to be growing in our nation, in our world today. We are aware of spiritual gurus and guides who reject the teachings of Jesus as being inspired, and they embrace teachers who say that they have new insights, new thoughts for us to understand that are very enlightening. They perceive Christianity to be outdated and repressive. A recent article talked about quarterback Aaron Rodgers. Now, I'm, I'm a big football fan, and I had Aaron Rodgers as my fantasy quarterback last year, the year before last, I guess, and he was great. Man, I tell you what, I was really glad I had him, and I admire whoever has him in our league right now because he's a top performer. But you know what? Uh, Tom Brady is, is probably the best quarterback of all time. If you're a, a Packers fan, you might disagree with that a little bit right now, but, but either way, Rodgers is a fantastic quarterback. But the article was talking about not his quarterback skills, but talking about the fact that there had been a shift in his understanding of faith. There had been a change. He had begun to, to reject the teachings that he had grown up with in knowing about Jesus Christ and now was embracing another type of, of teaching that has been made popular by a former pastor named Rob Bell. You may have been familiar with Rob Bell. Rob came out with a number of videos called NUMA years ago. We showed a few of them here, in fact, in, during services a long time ago. Uh, he was very popular, very good, but after a while, he began to reject biblical teaching on a variety of different subjects and has become very popular on the Oprah Winfrey Show. Maybe you've seen him on there or, or read different things he's come out with. And, and he became very influential on Aaron Rodgers. So Aaron Rodgers has, has rejected the faith of Jesus Christ and has now embraced a new age type of teaching that Rob Bell has made popular and is making popular among a lot of people. Jesus said a number of false messiahs will emerge before he returns. There'll be churches that teach false doctrines, catering to people with itching ears who only want to hear about things that please them like wealth and health and happiness. And we see those kinds of things, don't we? They're, they're everywhere around us in that regard. So what Jesus is saying is they'll become false teachers. People become confused spiritually. They won't really know what the truth is in many ways. Or they can say you can pick and choose what you want your faith to be. Now, there's a second thing he says here, and, and actually, uh, this is not in order uh, chronologically with what we're looking at with the verses. If you were to look over at verses 36 through 41, you'll find that it talks about the fact that Jesus is going to come back at a time when it's least expected, when it's least expected. Jesus said it would be like it was in the days of Noah. People were eating and they were drinking and giving in marriage, the normal types of pursuits of life. They were doing these things and, and suddenly it began to rain, didn't it? We know that Noah and his sons and maybe people they even hired were working on this ark for a long, long time. And Noah was a preacher of righteousness, it says in scripture, but no one else was listening to him. They made fun of him and, and thought, how could this crazy guy be right? Says it's going to rain, building this big boat, you know, there was, you know, that's just a, a, an oddity, something for people to look at, but, but not to embrace. But suddenly the day came when normal things were happening, and the rain then began to happen. And suddenly people's hearts began to panic. They began to change, and, and they began to ask to be brought onto the boat, in fact, to, to escape what was happening. And the, the waters of the deep began to explode up onto the earth's surface. And we know the story, don't we, of Noah's ark and, and how Noah and his family were the only ones that were saved during that time. And what Jesus is getting at right here, he's saying that, that it happened when no one else 
was expecting it. And that's why Jesus says there'll be a time when he isn't expected. He said he'll, uh, uh, he'll uh, arrive unexpectedly like a thief in the night. For over a year, Sherry and I had been uh, setting the alarm in our house. And every night we would go to bed, boom, set that alarm faithfully. Uh, we would wake up in the day, we would unset the alarm, and then when we leave the house, we'd always set the alarm uh, just as a security system. We, we think that's important to have that. And so uh, we were doing that, and we did it faithfully. Every once in a while, we would accidentally uh, set the alarm off, you know. Go to the back door, we're going to let the dogs out. Whoops, forgot to set off the alarm because now the alarm is going, okay. So we had to run over to the alarm, run over to that, that control box, punch in the code, and, and then suddenly the alarm stops. If you have an alarm system, you probably have done that before yourself. You understand what that is. And, you know, it used to be that the company would always call us when something like that happened, you know, but, but we hadn't been hearing them from them for about a year, and so we thought, well, we just got the code in fast enough, and they said, eh, you guys already know it. You're good. No problem on that. They just weren't contacting us. Well, we put in a new window in the front of our house, and by that, when that window was being put in, the, the uh, alarm or the, the sensor in that window, the old window had to be taken out. And so whenever we set the alarm, while that window was being put in, we would just bypass that window and all the rest of the house is still, still wired up and, and ready to go off if somebody uh, goes in a window or a door. But we wondered, you know, why still we weren't hearing from them. And we had them come out and uh, hook up the window alarm for that new window. And the guy says, um, oh, are you guys still with your landline? And I said, no, we have uh, cell phones now. He said, well, that isn't working with your cell phones. That alarm system isn't. We had absolutely no clue of that. They were still charging us. We're still making payments. But, but, yeah, but they were getting the benefit that we weren't getting, I guess. But here we are. They say, well, you've got to put a whole new box in to be able to receive the signal from your cell phone. So there we go. We have to do that. And now when we ask them to let the dogs out without letting the, setting the alarm off, the alarm goes. And, and now we get a phone call from them saying, hey, uh, we know that somebody just turned off your alarm. Everything must be okay. We won't send the police right now. For a long time, we were going when a thief could have broken into our home and had his way with our stuff, and no one would have known about it. No one would have known about that. We were so glad and looking back, saying that we were blessed that we did not have a thief breaking into our house because police wouldn't have been notified, ADT wouldn't have known about it, and we would have only found out when we got home. A thief looks for when you're going to be there and when you're not going to be there, don't they? They kind of know your system. They kind of know your, your routine. They know when you go to work. They know when you go here or there or, or whatever the case might be. And they watch, and then they make the attempt to go in, maybe disguised as a repairman or whatever, but they go in, and they try to take your stuff. They come when you least expect it. And Jesus said he is going to come back not to intentionally catch people off guard, but he is going to come back, and it will be a surprise when he comes back. People will not be expecting him to be there when he comes. He wants to make sure that we are ready and expecting him when he comes. He also says there's going to be a persecution of Christians. If you were to look at verses 9 and 10 with me, you'll see that it talks about some of the things that will happen. He says, you'll be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. You'll be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. Now, there are a lot of experts that say, you know, they think that there are more Christians being persecuted today than there have been all down through history. Now, that's a lot of persecution because back in the days of the New Testament and, and slightly after that, we know that, say, for example, in the Roman Colosseum, there were a number of people who were believers who were put to death out there. Either they had to fight lions or other kinds of wild animals. Gladiators put them to death. Sometimes they were burned at the stake. Some of them were crucified. A number of things happened to them. In fact, Nero, who was one of the Roman emperors, used to take Christians when he was having a party. And he would uh, tie them up. He would cover them with pitch. And he would hoist them up in his garden. And then as guests were arriving, he would light them on fire to provide lighting out in his garden while people could walk around while Christians are being burned out there. A number of things like that over the years happened and have happened down through time. But they say that even now that there is more persecution in this world than ever back in those days. Now there are Christians in a variety of places around our globe who are being beheaded. 
who are being maimed with acid or killed with swords or knives or guns because of their faith. Many are kicked out of their family or cast out of a village because of they, they became a believer in Jesus Christ. Nations like Saudi Arabia and North Korea and Iran and Syria and China are just a few of the nations where Christians are persecuted for their faith. Uh, the rise and spread of ISIS around our, our Middle East uh, areas uh, has really uh, draw, brought a lot of attention to persecution, hasn't it? We've probably seen the images of, of uh, a number of people in Egypt who were lined up in orange jumpsuit looking outfits and, and they were forced to kneel down while, while ISIS members beheaded them in front of a, a camera. Uh, this kind of thing has been happening now for a few years. Persecution is happening not because of just joy of killing people, it's happening because they want to get rid of those who believe in Jesus Christ and those who they perceive to be maybe friends of Israel as well. Now, Jesus said those kinds of things are not only going to happen, but they are also going to increase before he comes back. He also talks about signs in the heavens as well. If you were to look at verse 29 with me, it says, Immediately after the disasters of, or distress of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give us light. The stars will fall from the sky, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Now, Jesus said there'll be signs in the heavens, and we can believe him when he says that. Now, why can we believe him? First of all, the Bible tells us he's the creator of the world. Uh, the creator should know what's going to happen, shouldn't he? But secondly, if we look back to the time when Jesus was hanging on the cross, we know that around noontime, something occurred astronomically, didn't it? In the atmosphere. It tells us that the earth became darkened, didn't it? There was darkness on the earth for a period of time. Now, why was that? I believe part of it was because the creation itself was in sorrow because the creator was being crucified. So if this is happening like this, where there is darkness over the earth at that time, certainly we can believe Jesus when he says that before I come back, just before I come back, this kind of thing will be happening. I mean, I think it's immediately before that. I don't think it's a long time before. But at the same time, it gives us pause to think about some of the cataclysmic things that have been happening in our world even right now. Peter says the heavens will be rolled up like a scroll and the elements will be dissolved like a fire. Now that's kind of interesting to think about that, but they, it was described to me one time a long time ago. We used to have these uh, blinds in our house. Maybe you had them too. They were white, and they had like this spring-mounted roll at the top. You ever, ever have one of those where you pull it down and it has to stay there? But if you ever pulled it down, it just, boom, just goes right back up to the top again. It kind of spins around like that a little bit. That's kind of the impression of what Peter is saying right here, where the clouds or the earth or the atmosphere will be rolled up like a scroll. A scroll is on a, on a piece of wood, and it's, it's like leather scrolls wrapped around that. And it just kind of roll it right up. It's not stretched out like this anymore. It's just kind of rolled up tight. And that's the impression we find here about the heavens being rolled up like a scroll, and then the elements dissolved by fire. Jesus said also there will be signs on the earth itself. He says that creation is waiting like in birth pangs, just like a woman who is pregnant, I mean, having a baby any time. There are certain signs that, that are, are clear about that. It's obvious. If somebody sees a woman who is pregnant, they, they shouldn't ask, okay, just in case she really isn't pregnant. I've almost made that mistake before. But, but if you've seen her before, she's pretty trim and slim, and now she's way out here, you can pretty much be sure she's going to have a baby. Okay? There are signs that, that show that she's going to, to have that baby sometime in the near future. And as she gets closer, certainly there are birth pangs that begin to happen. If you've had a baby, you know that. Yeah, I, I've had a kidney stone. It's much worse than, a, than that, I realize. But, you know, some of you women have, I'm only teasing, okay? Uh, some of you women have had babies, and you understand that, that whole process. And you know what it feels like, and you know what you're going through, and you know how uncomfortable you are, and how your back is hurting you, and all that kind of stuff. You know that. You're ready for that time. And when Jesus and Paul describe the end of the world like this, the return of Jesus as birth pangs, it's like the earth itself is ready. It is saying it is time for a new birth. This old earth is going to be gotten rid of, and a new earth will be brought into its place right here. The old earth 
is impacted by sin. It's not the earth that was originally created. It's not the same type of thing that, that God wanted for it. When sin came into the world, a variety of things happened, whether it was pollution or, or all kinds of things, fires, floods, all that. And yet, it tells us in Scripture there will be a new earth that will be impregnated with righteousness. What a great thing that is. Paul, or Peter reminds them of the story of creation, that it existed by God's word formed out of water. He reminds them of Noah's flood, where the same waters destroyed the earth by God's word or command. And he also says that the present earth will be burnt up with fire, and the elements will dissolve it. Peter's logic is, if God can cause enough water to destroy the earth with a universal flood, certainly something that most people would think would be impossible, he's certainly able to destroy the earth with a universal fire as well. Now, there's some people who say, well, you know, maybe God's going to use some crazy dictator like the guy in North Korea to set off a nuclear bomb and begin to blow up the whole earth, that kind of thing. Well, you know, I don't think God needs our help, okay? I don't think he needs anybody else to do that for him. I think he's completely capable of saying, hey, it's not on your terms and your timetable. It's on my terms and in my timetable, and I will make it happen when I am ready for it to happen. He just wants us to be ready for that time. He also says there are signs in the culture as well. If you were to, to look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, uh, verses 1 through 15 with me, if you're using your Bible and you want to turn to that page, it begins on page 1854. Paul is writing about some of the things that will be happening uh, before that time. He calls it in the last days. Now, he's saying this, but mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves. Lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. He says, have nothing to do with them. Do we see those kinds of things happening in our world? We do, don't we? I mean, we'd have to be almost blind to not see that kind of thing. Uh, did they exist in Paul's world too? Yes, they did. They certainly did. But I think as we are watching our world, we're beginning to see that, that there's more and more stress, more and more tension, more and more people who are living only for themselves. We look at American culture in specific, we see it's much more self-centered than it was several years ago and much more crass as well that goes along with what's being said here. And we can see it, can't we? We know it. We hear it all the time. We watch it on television, whatever it might be. And as we see these kinds of things happening, uh, the Bible tells us we need to be alert to them. We certainly know that they're taking place, and we need to make sure that we are putting two and two together to understand what this is about. Because as we watch for these signs, we are actually watching biblical prophecy taking place before our very eyes. We need to watch this with the understanding, look at what's happening right now, look at what was written in Scripture, and match that up. Does this match? If it does, then we need to make sure that we are being ready for that time. Ready for that time. And that brings me to the third point. Believe the truth, be ready. Believe the truth, be ready. What else does the Bible say about what's going to happen? Well, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 Verse 13 has, a, beginning there, has a wonderful thing to say to us about what's going to take place. And this is what, what Paul says. He says, brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep, die, in other words, or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him, who have died in the relationship with him. According to the Lord's own word, uh, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, and with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. You know, a lot of what's been talked about so far in this message has been aiming more towards the negative, right? I mean, we're seeing catastrophes and, and behaviors and all that kind of stuff. But here we see that there is this wonderful side of what takes place when Jesus comes back, says the dead in Christ will be raised up 
first out of their graves, and then those who are still alive at that point, if he comes back while we're still alive, that will be talking about us, we will join them in the air, and we will be transformed into a new, with a new body forever and ever. Now, now, Paul is saying to them, he doesn't want them to be ignorant. When I was a, a boy, our household had several words that we weren't supposed to say, you know. You just weren't supposed to talk like that. And, and one of those things, we weren't supposed to call other people ignorant. You know, that was kind of a common thing for kids to say to other kids uh, at my time, at least anyway. And ignorant kind of had that negative connotation to it. But really, if we think about what ignorant is, ignorant is not a bad word. It's really a good word. It's a descriptive word. It means that we don't understand something. We're just ignorant of that. We don't know it. And, and so Paul says, I don't want you to not know what's going to happen. I want you to be aware of what is going to happen. So he tells them, he informs them about this, says that Jesus died and rose again. If we believe that he can raise from the dead, certainly we can believe his other part of what he's saying, that he's coming back again someday. And he says he's coming with a loud shout and a loud command. A lot of people have, have wondered about this loud command, wondering what Jesus is going to say. Certainly we don't know. We can speculate on it. Uh, maybe he might say something like, it's over. Okay? In other words, everything here, it's over. Or he might say like he did at the end while he was on the cross, it is finished. Maybe he'll just say, this world is finished. It is finished. It's also possible maybe for a couple of other things. He might say, enough. Enough of this, okay? Enough of the sickness, enough of the sorrow, enough of all these, of the sin that's going on. But I think there's a strong possibility he might say something else. He might say, come forth. Now, why do I say that? Well, if you think with me just for a moment, you probably have heard the story of a guy named Lazarus. Lazarus was one of Jesus' best friends. He was a, had two sisters, Mary and Martha. And Jesus would hang out at their home oftentimes. And, and Lazarus died. And Lazarus was buried in a tomb behind a rock. And, and, you know, he'd been dead for a few days when Jesus shows up. And Mary and Martha are disappointed that Jesus wasn't there to heal him when he was sick and everything. But then after talking with him for a little while, then Jesus prays, and it tells us that he gave a command. He said, roll that stone away. And then he gave a command, and he said to Lazarus, come forth. And you know what happened? He came out of the grave. He walked out. He was still wearing his grave clothes, but he came back alive at that point. And because of the fact that the dead in Christ are going to raise up first out of their graves, wouldn't it make a little bit of sense to think that maybe he might be saying, come forth, because now they're going to start coming forth. They have permission, so to speak. They have a command to come forth from the grave, from the Creator, from the Savior as well. And here we find that Paul goes on to echo the words about Jesus saying he's going to come like a thief in the night. He says in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 5, But you, brothers, are not in darkness so that this day should surprise you like a thief. So we need to believe the truth that this is going to happen. We also need to believe the truth that there is a reward involved in this as well. In 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 57, it talks a lot about the resurrection. And one of the places in there, it talks about this new body that we're going to have, okay? And, you know, if we watch television, we see advertisements for Weight Watchers. We see Nutrisystem. We saw that, that Marie Osmond lost 50 pounds on there. And we see all these other people who are, are in much better shape. And then you see these advertisements for the gyms. And everybody has a flat set of abs. And they have tight rear ends. And they have all this stuff that, you know, just shows working out. And all these things are, are so good. Join the gym uh, Join Weight Watchers, all these things, to get the right kind of body while you're here. They really try to emphasize that, and understandably so. They want us to take good care of ourselves, and they want our money, of course, too. But they, they, they want us to take good care of ourselves, be the best we can be here. But you know what? I have a guarantee for you that the body we have right here, at its very best, will be a Model T compared to the Ferrari we're going to get in the future, okay? Okay. That body is going to really be the best body ever, ever, that will, be the, that will last forever. It will look great forever. It will be just the body that Jesus has designed for us to be who we are in his presence 
forever and ever and ever. We also get a new home. Isn't that great to think about that? A lot of us last week were thinking we might get a new home because of the hurricane, okay? <laughs> this time we get a new home because of a good thing, all right? Because Jesus said that, that when I go to heaven, I am going there to prepare a place for you. And in my Father's house are many rooms, right? I'm going to prepare a place for you, and then I'm going to come back and take you to be where I am. Isn't that great to know that the place he has designed for us will be just right for us? You can walk into a person's home sometimes and you say, man, that is that person. You can see uh, the collectibles, you can see the, the furniture, you can see the things that they have, the sound system, whatever it might be, the media, uh, everything just kind of points to that person. You can tell that person lives there. And I don't know what exactly Jesus has in mind for us, but it will be just right, just right air-conditioned, I'm sure, power on all the time, never goes off for seven or eight days at a time, it will always be on because the power is from God himself. We'll receive rewards there too. Paul wrote, finally there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness with the Lord, the righteous judge will give me on that day. And not to me only, but to all who have loved his appearing. So if you love his appearing, you too will get a crown of righteousness. A moment ago we, we sang part of the song, How Great Thou Art. What a Great song that was to have that in a medley with the, the other song that they were doing. One verse of that goes like this. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, my God, how great thou art. How do we prepare for that day? What do we do? We pay attention, we get ready. You know, at the beginning of June, on television, advertisements all the time, make sure you get your hurricane kit ready. Hurricane season from June through the end of November. They want to make sure that we have fresh batteries, that we have water, make sure that we do all the things we're supposed to do, that we have our house boarded up, that we have a place to go, an evacuation route. Uh, they want to make sure we have food with us, that we can take batteries, flashlights, lanterns, make sure we pack up all of our important documents and take those with us. They just want to make sure that we are ready and prepared for what we need to take with us. And in essence, Jesus is saying, get ready, here is a kit for my return. Here's what you need to do. You need to be ready. We get prepared for a hurricane and we realize it could be a matter of life and death, don't we? We get prepared because we know that someday we're either going to be glad that we got, got ready or we'll wish we'd been ready. And the same thing is true in our relationship with God. We'll either look back and say, I'm glad I was ready for that, or like the old song says, I wish we'd all been ready. I wish I'd been ready. The Bible tells us don't procrastinate about accepting Christ and being baptized. We can be a nice person, we can do good things, but if we don't accept Christ, we are going to miss out. The return of Jesus Christ affects everybody, no matter who they are. Secondly, we do what Jesus said, be always on the watch and pray. That means that we have a right relationship with him. We keep close with the Lord, we talk with the Lord, we're alert to the signs we see around us, and we recognize that we're, this can happen at any time. We don't want to get caught off guard. And then next, we live lives that indicate that we belong to Christ, that the Holy Spirit is living inside us. Peter wrote that we ought to live lives that are holy and godly, looking forward to the day of God and speeding its coming. We ought to make every effort, he says, to, to be found spotless and blameless and at peace with Jesus Christ. Let me ask you a question. If you knew that Jesus was going to come in the next seven days, how would that impact your life? What would you begin to do? Would you begin to say, you know, I better find my Bible. You start digging through stuff to try to find it. It's got dust all over you. Blow that off and start turning through the pages, hoping you can find something there that you remember. Is that kind of the way you begin to approach that? And maybe you'd begin to pray and maybe begin to ask God to forgive you and maybe you begin to be kind to people and, and some different things. I mean, chances are, I think that a lot of people would respond like that. Let me kind of throw out a scenario to you. Let me change that image from a week from today to what if it was today? What if you were at home this evening? You're watching football on TV or something else. 
and, and you are comfortable. You are sitting in a chair, and you are so comfortable in that chair, and you don't even want to get up, even to get food, because you just feel so good right there, and it's just it's such a good thing. And suddenly, something happens. You begin to hear a sound outside that you have never heard before. You, you think, if you're from up north, you maybe have heard a, a tornado siren before, and you know how loud that can be. Or maybe you, you think about these guys who come by with these tricked out you know, systems and their cars are so loud you hear them about five blocks away and you almost get vibrated out of your house because of the bass. But, but this isn't like that. This is the sound of almost 10,000 trumpets and they're all just loud and just steady, just a loud sound. And as you are, are hearing this, you're you're suddenly finding yourself getting up out of your chair or off your couch and you're saying, what's going on? You go to the door and you open up the door and you look out and you see your neighbors and they're all out of the house and they're all standing looking at the sky and you notice that out in the street there have been a couple of people stopped their cars out there, have gotten out, cars still running, but they're looking up also. Little kids have quit playing, they're looking up and you begin to get out in the yard and you begin to look up also. And as you look up, it's, it's like 8 o'clock at night maybe and it's bright and it's just bright outside, and, and you're, you're, you're kind of squinting because of the brightness, and, and as you're, you're watching this and, and you're hearing this sound you've never heard before, you hear voices, and those voices are chanting three words, all the same word, but just repeating that word, holy, holy, holy. And you're saying, where's that coming from? And as your eyes adjust, you are seeing 10,000 upon 10,000 angels in the sky. And they are there, and, and this is just such a moment that it has never occurred before, never will occur again, and you're thinking, I can't believe this. It's surreal. Am I dreaming right now? Is this the real deal? And then as you're watching, suddenly everything gets quiet. The, the trumpets stop. The angels stop saying, holy, 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 and the sound is just deathly quiet. And then all of a sudden, the angels just kind of divide in half, one on this side and one half on this side. It's almost like a curtain is pulled in the cloud, and you see Jesus riding on a white horse, coming out of the clouds, and suddenly, as you're watching, it's just like you can't keep on your feet. You just fall on your knees. And you see everybody else is falling on their knees also. And as you're watching this, suddenly you are seeing people who are just kind of going up into the sky. And, and it's just like the graves are being emptied up. They're going up and they're being transformed. They're being changed in the sky as Jesus is there. And you can't help but bow a knee. And you say, I hope I get taken as well. I hope after all the dead are raised up out of the ground, the dead in Christ will be raised up next. I hope I'm in that group. It's going to be very similar to that. What if it did happen tonight? What if you were watching that game on TV or that Hallmark Channel or whatever you're watching and suddenly all that began to occur you went outside you saw a scene that had never been seen before never will be seen again and you you are being impacted in that and your eternity is being shown in that as well will you be ready for that day for that night Listen, God loves you. Jesus came the first time to die for you on the cross, to remove your sins. The second time he's coming is not to do that. The second time he's coming is to, to take us back to heaven with him. And then comes a judgment day, it says. Are you ready for that time? I hope you are. I tell you that with all sincerity in my heart and love for you, even if I've not met you yet, I love you enough to tell you this because I want you to know the truth. We all need to be ready for that day. It can't be something we, we pause and say, wait, wait, everybody stop. 
while I now accept Christ and then all of a sudden go ahead now and finish up what you're doing. Can't be like the old commercials on television where an accident is about to occur with somebody without their seatbelt and they're able to pause or go in slow motion, put on the seatbelt and then they're protected. It doesn't work that way. When it happens, it happens. Friend, know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Live for him. Be ready because he is coming someday. It may not be in your lifetime, but it could be. I hope you're ready. You know, we're going to sing a song of invitation here in a second, and this will be a wonderful time to say, you know what, this is where I start getting ready. This is where I say, Jesus, I'm putting you on a throne room of my heart. I'm getting off of it. I've been trying to run my own life, trying to do my own thing, you know, leading my own way, living for myself, but I realize how foolish that is to do that, how presumptive that is to do that. And so I'm going to humbly get off of that throne and I'm going to willfully place you there and ask you to be, become Lord, the Savior of my life. When you come up today, if that's your decision, I'm going to talk to you about what you need to do in doing that to be ready, all right? And if you say, I, I need to rededicate my life today, you can do that right where you are and just say, God, please forgive me. I haven't been doing as I should. I want to recommit my life to you. Maybe you want to come forward and even say that as well. But whatever you need to do at this point, I hope you will do it. Because what I've shared with you today is as true as you are sitting here today and I'm standing here. We need to be ready. Let's stand together and let's sing this song.